it was a pleasure to speak with Yoni and, you know, from the, the younger demographic and getting insight there, let's, let's now look at transformational growth from a different uh, uh, perspective, and that is from a geographical one. So welcome to our final A plenary session on transformational growth. This is where we explore the reality of distributed ledger technology innovation in developing markets. In this panel, we're going to explore how developing markets of South Africa, Indonesia, and India are exploring and diving into blockchain and DLT. How is it shifting and changing the dynamics of a nation? And what opportunities for growth are we seeing? And how transformative is it really? So ladies and gentlemen, you're invited to join in on this conversation. So if you have any questions that come to mind for the panelists, please share, and we're going to include it in the discussion. So you just uh, write your question down in the chat box. We're also going to have some interactive polls here. And uh, when we do ask your opinion about the polls, you just take a look at the top right uh, part of your screen and... Uh, and participate. So this is this is meant to be a much more interactive conversation and audience. Uh, get ready, listen in and share. So without further ado, let's welcome our panelists right now. First, we have Meryl Ford. She is Manager of Emerging Opportunities, South African Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Next, we have Amit Jindal, President of the Indian Office Government Blockchain Association. Last but not least, we are joined by Pandu Sastro Wardoyo, co-founder of the Indonesian Blockchain Association. Meryl, Amit, Pandu, welcome. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much, Andy. Nice to be here, Andy. Lovely. Wonderful. Wonderful to have all of you. You know, emerging markets, developing nations, you know, often we think about it uh, as, as not necessarily leaders in innovation, but there is no doubt that, uh, in fact, what we're seeing, at least from our editorial uh, vantage point at Forecast, is that, indeed, it's uh, some of the most interesting innovations are happening in emerging markets. Um, and so before we, we engage more in a group discussion, I'd like to give time uh, for each of you to introduce yourselves a little bit more for the audience. Uh, share with us your role, what you're doing in the space, what you're doing in the country, and the goals that you have uh, where you are. So um, Pandu, let's start with you. You're, you're a technologist and you consult for companies Companies looking for real-world blockchain implementations. Um, do share. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Anjin. And thank you for your time, everyone. Um, my name is Pandu Sasradio, uh, which you can call me Pandu, would be easier. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the Indonesian Blockchain Association. Uh, it's currently still the only association of blockchain companies in Indonesia. Uh, we are a B2B2G uh, association, actually. So we connect uh, multiple businesses with the government. Um, we currently have 21 members, 21 member companies, which includes most of the exchanges in Indonesia, most of the legal exchanges in Indonesia, I should say. Um, I used to work for IBM, so I actually came from that space, from uh, the enterprise IT space. Uh, I transitioned to blocking uh, back in 2017. Um, and uh, that was with a company called Blockchain Zoo. So I co-founded that company. I also co-founded Blocksphere. Uh, both of these are consulting companies that are listed in Gartner for blockchain consulting. I think they were for both of these companies were were um, the first. I think the well, this is uh, Blockchain Zoo was the first in Asia, in Southeast Asia, and in Blocksphere was the first in Indonesia. So. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, um, that's that's me. Um, I, I'd like to share more today about how Indonesia is actually um, uh, what kind of market Indonesia is. A lot of people probably want to know more um, from the crypto perspective and also from the technological perspective. And uh, I'm keen to talk more. Thank you so much, Pandu. All right, Meryl, uh, you're, you're based right there in South Africa. You work for the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. And I, I do believe uh, some uh, congratulatory uh, remarks are in order. 75th anniversary is there. Yeah, we've been there a long time and we've, we've managed to change um, the world in South Africa for, for quite a while. So, yeah, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much. 
Um, I'm going to do a very short presentation to kind of um, help to kind of explain um, what I'm doing and what I do, um, etc. So, so basically, um, I'm currently facilitating the South African National Blockchain Alliance, or SANBA. Um, it's, an, it's an initiative by our um, Department of Science and Innovation, um, and it's hosted by the CSR, where I work. So, uh, you know, I think this is quite significant because, uh, you know, as far as I know, it's one of the few examples of government actually actively um, supporting research and, and, and innovation, research development and innovation in collaboration with um, with um, other sectors. So, so basically what, what it is, is a partnership between government, business, academia, and civil society to catalyze the use of blockchain technologies within South Africa. Um, you'll see a QR code um, in the top right-hand corner. You're welcome to have a look at that. Uh, it's, it's the launch of Samba. We were launched um, earlier this year on the 3rd of April. Um, we currently sit within, um, as I said, the CSR, within an, an initiative called the Office of Digital Advantage, which is the ICT um, Research, Development and Innovation Roadmap um, for the country. So very quickly, SANBA um, aims to connect um, academia, civil society, business and government into a pre-competitive collaboration space. Um, we aim to facilitate skills development, advocacy and education, all things blockchain. Um, we look to catalyze blockchain adoption in all sectors of South Africa. And we're looking at leveraging this whole blockchain ecosystem as a lobbying platform to tackle issues um, blocking blockchain adoption in South Africa. Um, just one last slide. Um, we decided um, initially, um, I was actually asked to, to develop a strategy, a national strategy for blockchain research, development and innovation um, in the country. And um, I decided to go with a kind of an ecosystem approach. So we've developed kind of an ecosystem and we see Sandba as sitting in the middle um, sort of connecting bits of the ecosystem to each other and unblocking bits of the ecosystem. So, for example, um, linking innovators to potential funding sources in government and external to government. And we've had quite a lot of success, even though we're quite kind of quite small and early on um, in our, our evolution. Um, we're very excited uh, about that. Um, just very quickly, we're in the preparatory stage at the moment. Uh, we're hoping within a year or two to do kind of some really very good piloting quick win application areas in blockchain and then expansion in a couple of years after that with large scale rollouts. Um, there's really a lot of interest um, from, from government, um, from our Department of Science and Innovation, and also from our Department of Communication and Digital Technologies. Um, we've just, for example, had a report by um, the Pre Presidential Commission on, on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, um, and the Department of Communication has, has set up a 4 project office that we're working closely with. So good things are going to be start happening very soon. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I, I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. And... Uh, uh, Amit Jindal, uh, yeah, it's interesting what's uh, happening in India right now. Uh, share with us what you're seeing uh, from both uh, from from both you know a, a local grassroots level all the way up to national government. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Angie. Good afternoon and good evening to all the participants. So let me start. Internet Internet came in 1990s. And we can't think of lifestyle or business without the internet. But the first use protocol of the internet came in late 1960s, when the Ethernet was established and was originally funded by the US Department of Defense. So the government and government policies played a critical role in adoption of the new technologies. Likewise, India is also focusing on the new technology blockchain. Blockchain is a very latest technology and it has a potential to boost the global economy by 1.76 trillion by 2030. India is a 2.5 trillion dollar economy and our PM, Prime Minister PM Modi have a vision 
to take our economy to 5 trillion dollar economy by 2025 and for this we are focusing on the emerging technologies like ar vr artificial intelligence robotic process automation blockchain and in india we believe these new technology can help us in building the business of work 250 billion dollars by 2025 india is a country of 28 states and nine union territories the best part is that more than 50 percent of the indian states are currently working into the blockchain space i am currently working in my own consultancy company and representing central government where it's a first incubation center by the name of epiri where we are working to promote the startups in the blockchain space yeah thank you so much thank you amit well, audience, now uh, we want to get your thoughts here and let's go to our first poll and take this moment to ask your opinion here. Uh, and the question is, what do you consider is the biggest opportunity for blockchain in addressing challenges faced in emerging and developing countries? Is it A, reducing costs of remittances? Is it B, solving identity issues? Is it C, verified transparent data for farmers on their contributions for global supply chains. So uh, again, take a look at the top corner right of your screen and please do input your answers. But this is a, a great opportunity to also pull our panelists here. Um, Pandu Merrill, uh, I'm curious uh, how you would answer this. What, what do you consider is the biggest opportunity for blockchain in emerging uh, and developing countries right now? And Amit, I want to start with you. Um, the, the, you know, all three of the options, remittances, solving identity issues, uh, verified transparent data for farmers uh, that contribute to global supply chains. All three are super important in India. Um, well, for me, I mean, definitely digital identity problems. Um, you know, once you, you once once you can kind of figure out the identity problem, I mean, uh, in Africa as a whole, in particular, um, I mean, there are many countries in Africa that, that, you know, don't even have kind of, don't talk about, not even digital identity, they don't have proper identity systems. So, I mean, that's, that's a huge opportunity um, to actually uh, kind of leverage blockchain as a bridge over the digital divide, for example. Um, so, and once you actually have an identity, you can access all kinds of services. You can send your kids to school. I mean, you can you can move. You can you can you can have a bank account. So for me, digital identities is is the most critical thing that needs to be be solved um, via blockchain in Africa. Thank you, Meryl. Pandu, what what are your thoughts? How 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 would you answer this poll question in Indonesia? Well, I think. That uh, the core question is actually a trick question. And, and this is in my opinion. And uh, I agree with Meryl that um, identity would be very important in this case, uh, simply because it forms the basis of both of the other poll answers. Uh, when we do uh, something that's related to farmer supply chain, we uh, one of the major things that we need to basically determine within uh, countries like Indonesia and probably South Africa as well, we uh, need to make sure that the farmer has uh, an identity class uh, that makes sense for them and uh, also make sure that they can uh, log uh, whether their assets and asset ownership and everything else that is related to uh, creating, uh, uh, making them part of a global supply chain. So identity becomes basically the only answer in this case. Of course, remittance is also very important. And when we're talking about transactional things, uh, though, uh, but I think uh, it's still a trick question in, in that case because uh, I think it would be different for each country. Uh, Indonesia is probably similar to, to India in terms of uh, like the number of provinces that we have. We have 32 provinces and we have 18,000 islands, of course. Uh, so, of course, uh, the, the things that relate to uh, things that are transactional, uh, inter-island, uh, like the things that uh, consensus is doing I2, with I2I, uh, the island to island stuff in the Philippines, that fits a certain geography, but I'm not sure that it would fit exactly. Uh, like, if, if I think the question is too general. It needs to be like uh, in each of our countries, it might, we might have different answers. Uh, but again, I think 
again, great question. Identity would form the basis of all of those. That, that's a that's a great answer and, and a great caveat as well. How how about you, Amit? If yeah. in your view, if it, you know, very three um, basic uh, you know questions and uh, or or rather options for this poll, which one would you pick? So I agree with Amit on the digital identity problem. It's a trillion dollar problem of the industry. In 2019 also, we got a fraud of five trillion dollar fraud because of the digital identity. So it's an industry problem which we need to solve and it have different use cases if we solve the problem of identity management and KYC. It has different use cases on the e-commerce, banking and it can help us in forming a lot of industry issues. So definitely I will bang on the, at the current situation for the digital identity. Well, uh, all three of you uh, answered digital identity, and in fact, uh, the majority of our audience also answered that. 47.1% in the poll agreed that solving identity issues was actually the biggest opportunity for blockchain in addressing challenges in emerging and developing nations. Um, Pandu, I want to pick up on, on that as well. I mean, uh, Indonesia is uniquely experienced in December decentralization after all it is uh, that's exactly how governing is structured it's already very decentralized uh, with a nation made up of more than 17,000 islands as we all know um, and so you know how do you how do you uh, make sure that everybody uh, can get services because you know who they are Okay, so um, to answer that, I would also have to describe uh, to a more, gen more general audience who might not be uh, very familiar with how Indonesia is structured. Uh, Indonesia is uh, very decentralized, as in uh, the way we construct our country ever since uh, the fall of Suharto back in the 90s. Um, we had a lot of, we have a lot of regional autonomy. So uh, we're not a federation, but uh, we have a lot of regional autonomy that reaches into the villages. And uh, that means that there's a lot of data fragmentation. Like looking at it from an engineer, I'm an IT engineer, my uh, focus is the engineering part, looking at it from that uh, point of view. Uh, we see a lot of um, data fragmentation issues, uh, especially when it relates to identity. Uh, just Indonesia, uh, every every Indonesian in their wallets basically have like multiple identity cards. I like to uh, mention. So anyway, um, the way we we try to uh, basically solve these issues is uh, first uh, twofold. Um, we go to the enterprises that are basically looking for business value and basically looking to expand the market. Uh, by uh, trying to, uh, and, and that is basically uh, sort of a business use case that we do. So when you do blockchain consulting in Indonesia, it becomes not just, uh, not just regular tech consulting, it actually becomes a business consulting for consortium. So um, the way we've done it these past what, three years is uh, to discuss with the enterprises and help them uh, construct consortiums. And that becomes more of a consortium play um, then of course you need to, you know, have steering committees and uh, like even within the consortium we need to define like who creates the policies, etc. So um, that's for the private sector. For the governmental sector, uh, we go basically to the top, and that that is why we have the association. Uh, the uh, Indonesian Blockchain Association is helping uh, the government itself to understand blockchain better, do the research. We do a lot of free work for the government, uh, to be honest, uh, a lot of the uh, R&D for them as well. Um, and uh, some projects are uh, coming through, but there's a lot of investment that is required. Like that. But, but it's, it's also very important because it's not just important for Indonesia, it's also important for the future of our business. Um, because the future of the business in Indonesia is going to be a lot of these uh, applicable um, sort of technologies, uh, practical ones. Got it. Got it. I'm curious what's happening in South Africa, um, Meryl. We, so, so th Pandu, thanks for sharing that. Um, Meryl, you've recently, the organization has recently changed strategies, um, yeah. now hosting the South African National Blockchain Alliance, uh, which I understand has about 300 members uh, across South Africa that includes startups and 
academia, government, industry? How are you all collaborating together in this new strategy? Um, well, the whole COVID thing kind of took us by surprise, as it did everyone else. Um, we were actually, we went into lockdown a couple of days before we were meant to launch. So we, we did a very quick um, reconfiguration and did everything online. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. Um, we kind of tested out all of these new technologies. Um, and yeah, so, so at the moment, the way it's working is basically... Um, We've got a, a, a who's who that we we're creating on the on the website. So the idea is to um, kind of register yourself as someone who's interested in blockchain. You might be an organisation or an individual, um, et cetera, et cetera. We've also got a, another tool that that we're busy working on at the moment. Um, that's kind of we call it. It's, it's kind of a bounty hunt kind of environment. So the idea is anyone who actually needs blockchain skills. Um, can, can register a, a challenge and um, it gives like the young blockchain developers of which there are quite a lot in South Africa an opportunity to actually work some uh, earn some money rather than than actually um, you know doing it for fun at night kind of thing so so we're quite excited about that um, and what we're also doing is we're using um, our Department of Science and Innovation to kind of uh, help um, SMEs and startups access other government departments. So we're kind of introducing um, young startups with innovations that, where we think there's a lot of potential. We have one, for example, um, that's looking at the whole issue of uh, kind of the fraud that ca that happened during the COVID outbreak um, with regards to procurement of PPE and other and other things at a municipal level. Um, and he's busy piloting his, his his blockchain solution at a municipality at the moment in in Cape Town. So you know, so so that's the kind of thing that we're doing. We literally are a connector. Um, connecting um, people to uh, opportunities, problems to solutions, uh, markets to innovators, research to real problems. So yeah, so so that's kind of our approach at the moment. We um, we have been funded um, by the Department of Science and Innovation, so um, it makes it possible to create um, projects like uh, with the one project that we uh, are about to go out on tender for. Unfortunately, we still have to do the procurement thing. So we, we go out on we're going to go out on tender. Um, for a Team South Africa blockchain initiative, something that will truly pull in um, uh, people from government, from the private sector, from startups, from academia, uh, from civil society, just to kind of come up with something that will really make an impact in South Africa. So we're quite excited about that as well. That will probably happen in January next year. What do you think the first project uh, from from uh, the, the most impactful for communities would be? Can you give us any specifics? Well, um, what we're doing, well, the, the whole digital identity um, use case, once again. So, so um, at the moment, um, so our, our financial institutions are, are getting very involved in the whole blockchain, um, SSI, self-sovereign identity environment. Mm -hmm. Um, they've developed um, quite a nice um, KYC system between the various banks. Um, it, it was a proof of concept, but um, you know it works. Um, the problem that they're facing from from those financial institutions is that, as in any kind of, um, as has happened around the world, any kind of um, innovation is coming kind of um, bottom up and not top down. So it's the, the techies in those organizations that have kind of pushed um, management to do something, but and it, and, and it worked extremely well, saved a lot of money, etc. cetera. Um, but there's still a bit of unwillingness from the powers that be that make the decisions to actually really start implementing some of these solutions. Um, so one of the, the startups has has is starting a, a center of excellence for SSI, and we're busy helping him find funding 
for that. Very good. Thank you. Amit, um, I want to bring uh, India into this. Uh, just uh, really interesting developments in the space. Um, earlier this year, the Supreme Court of India struck down an RBI ban on uh, crypto projects uh, and, and cryptocurrency uh, banking. Uh, and that really opened up a lot of enthusiasm uh, across the sector. And then from a policy point of view, uh, there came uh, some, some legislation that is on the books that potentially could be more restrictive. What's happening in India yeah, yeah, right yeah. now? Yeah, it was a setback which came in 2018 where Reserve Bank of India banned the cryptocurrency trading in India and banking was not supporting at all the cryptocurrency trading. But eventually, finally, in March 2020, our Supreme Court ruled out that decision and they allowed trading of the cryptocurrencies. So that is a good boom which started in India. Even after that event, the exchange Binance have also promised to fund $50 million in India into startups in blockchain. So that is a good thing which is happening in, in India. Even at the policy side, uh, we have Niti Ayo, which is a thing policy tank for Indian government. They have come with the policy guidelines for the blockchain. Even the state level also have come up. One of the state Tamil Nadu have already come up with the blockchain policy, and we are primarily focused on the blockchains. The good part is that government is quite active in our blockchain space. Just to give you an example, our one of the state Tamil Nadu along with the central government ministry of IT electronics have started a project on blockchain on the uh, property registration management onto blockchain and they were shortlisted and they are the finalists for the Gartner I on innovation government 2020 award also. So that is a good part where government is actively participating into the blockchain use cases and working onto that thing. Plus further we the one of the state government is going for a e-voting for the council member elections, which we are planning to happen in 2021. So that I can see a lot of things are happening from the blockchain space and where the government are participating. Yeah. Very interesting from voting uh, to digital identity. Um, you know, as we know, everyone uh, developing emerging economies can really help nations leapfrog or leap forward as a result of technology innovation. We've seen it time and time again across Asia. And now we're seeing it again, potentially with blockchain. What's the reality on the ground? What's really happening? Are we seeing industry and government working in concert together? And is it working? Pandu, what do you think? I think we are, uh, and my report from the ground is uh, that there's a lot of projects going on in Indonesia that is a collaboration between the private sector and the public sector. Um, my own company is doing uh, several uh, things with government-owned entities uh, that is uh, more of a uh, PPP, private public partnership. Uh, so, um, and I can't disclose a lot, but uh, most of these projects are uh, based on uh, the fact that uh, the government uh, has uh, one part of the business and the private sector has another part of the business and they want to trust each other so they are using blockchain to do it. I can't reveal more than that, but there's a lot of things that are, that are in the works. Uh, I think also that um, in terms of leapfrogging, uh, leapfrogging can also be done uh, from the cryptocurrency sector as well. And I haven't mentioned that uh, part uh, tonight yet. Um, the cryptocurrency sector in Indonesia has grown a lot. Uh, last time we spoke, I think we spoke last year, uh, and that was towards the end of last year. I told you that there were a lot of uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, but uh, there were uh, none were uh, ratified yet. We currently have 13 ratified cryptocurrency exchanges, and this is from a. We, we started in 2018 with only six total blockchain companies, and we currently have 66 blockchain companies in total, whether cryptocurrency exchanges or um, um, projects or um, consulting companies like mine. Um, so um, the leapfrogging can happen from the government perspective, is what I'm saying, and the private sector is assisting in that. But the leapfrogging can also happen, uh, and primarily in Indonesia, it can also happen uh, from the private sector as well. We are seeing a lot of creativity and uh, a lot of uh, new 
uh, projects that are very, very interesting. Um, so um, I'm excited to actually see that. Um, one thing that I'm still yeah. expecting the government to actually make a, you know, um, uh, progress towards is actually uh, CBDCs because there's been a lot of research and been a lot of papers. But yeah, so in continuation of that, uh, that would be interesting to see. We have a question from the audience, uh, and I'll read it to you now, uh, and it's regarding digital IDs. Uh, is there any resistance among the public regarding being tracked by governments or other organizations with their digital ID? The idea is that blockchain offers total ownership of your ID, but it does have to be validated. So um, everyone, any issues getting people to move to a digital ID? Um, if I may, um, the way we're approaching it in Indonesia is not to actually outright uh, change the user experience of the, the current digital, of the current identity parts. We're using blockchain to basically harmonize between the data sets of uh, different uh, identity cards. So you will, uh, it would actually um, not change a lot of the user experience in, in Indonesia. And I think that's key uh, in terms of actually getting adoption for blockchain technologies. You, work at the back end, sort of. You don't change the user experience that much. Of course, that means that you don't implement the blockchain fully. Uh, there is a lot of uh, front end stuff that is not the apps, uh, that is actually just um, a lot of, inter it's, it's more of a systems integration, more of an enterprise implementation thing. But that actually works well so far. And uh, I'm talking about government entities and also I'm talking about like private entities as well. Um, um, in private entities, uh, for example, it becomes a uh, ease of customer onboarding. It makes it easier for customers to onboard uh, in different companies that are collaborating together with a digital identity. Um, and in government, uh, it actually helps, you know, uh, harmonize the data and uh, make sure that there's a dashboard to see the entire uh, thing. So, um, yeah, I think that's the way to go. Yeah. I do, I part, of, think... part of it is, sorry, um, I mean, I was just going to say part of it is, is educating the, the, the individual, you know, uh, that's something that India is probably thinking about a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely awareness is the key thing, which we are looking for the activities. And just to add on, on the identity side, uh, on the digital ID, India, like government can track from the other mechanics also. So like we have just got Aadhaar where every person on the in India can be tracked to the other and we got a busy locker also where people can keep their digital identity centrally but it's a centrally located so having the digital identity on the blockchain will be helpful for everybody but tracking by the government they are using other mechanics to track the people so I will differ on that thing yeah um maybe can I maybe just put my two cents in um of course so <laughs> um I mean, so this, the whole the issue of digital identity versus self-sovereign identity. I mean, theoretically, with self-sovereign identity, you shouldn't be able to track people and they, they should um, be at the center of, of, of the ecosystem and they should decide who to share their identity information with. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I, I think... If we go for something like self-sovereign identity, it will, it will solve that kind of, of issue around privacy, etc. However, um, we are talking about um, a developing country um, and to actually expect people to take full responsibility for their, their digital identity and, their, and perhaps on something like a mobile phone, I mean, could be problematic. Um, um, I think maybe that's being solved to some extent um, because you're getting um, quite a lot of um, institutions now starting to offer custodial services. Um, but still, uh, I think for South Africa, uh, I think it will be a major cultural change. Um, mm. uh, you know, yeah. That, that's, that's a really great point, Meryl. Um, it's one to be absolutely thoughtful about. Uh, not everybody is quite there yet. And so, yeah. you know, as governments, how, how do we uh, implement without 
truly, you know, uh, disrupting because there is a digital divide, at least yes. of understanding. Um, yeah. let, let's let's get to the audience with our final poll of uh, the plenary session A. Um, the question is, what do you consider as the biggest challenge to blockchain adoption face? faced in emerging and developing countries. It kind of uh, 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 tails uh, your point, Meryl. Um, do you think it's connectivity? Uh, B, is it lack of relevant skills? Or is it C, absence of financial support for startups in blockchain and the tech sector? So again, um, do log in your, uh, your, your opinion, uh, top right of your screen, and lock in your answers. And uh, as we wrap up this conversation, we will uh, share with you all uh, what you collectively think is the biggest challenge. But um, I want to I want to start wrapping up this conversation with just a few minutes left uh, with an ans with a question from the audience. The question is this. Do you believe that blockchain would leverage level of bottom of pyramid to a higher living standard? Essentially, the leapfrog question. Do you think that blockchain itself could unlock that? Meryl, start with you. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's why that's why I'm in this space. Um, you know, I, I, I believe quite strongly that the real opportunity for blockchain in South Africa and in Africa perhaps as well and maybe even other developing countries is not in the cryptocurrency and, and fintech spaces but it's in the application of blockchain in spaces where um, there's a need where you need a, a trust foundation for things um, to stop fraud to stop uh, you know issues around digital identity etc cetera, etc cetera. so so definitely um, I believe blockchain can do that. Pandu, what do you think? I think it would. Um, one of the things that uh, surprised people about Indonesia is the um, level of uh, our, the, the way our uh, economy is structured is quite different from others. Uh, we, as a nation, we only have like 2% uh, of people actually owning credit cards. Yet, we actually have the highest um, rate of e-commerce use of any country, which is really strange. Uh, basically, we like innovative products. We just don't like traditional products. Uh, credit cards have a bad name here. Any banking credits have a bad name here. So, um, and, and you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of financial innovation, though, that happens here. And um, all of these financial innovations have to do with, uh, you know, getting costs to a level where uh, low-income groups can uh, basically yeah. come in. Um, people who are not unbanked, but underbanked, sort of, not using their accounts uh, for anything um, so um, I, I think I think the, the, the uh, Indonesia has uh, the the pathway that Indonesia is on right now is uh, really yeah. interesting to when you look at it uh, more closely, uh, not just from the crypto space but also from the technology space because a lot of the cost reduction is actually happening in the technology space as well, uh, and yeah. I think it'll help uh, with uh, um, everything uh, related uh, with like the user experience of being a citizen in Indonesia actually gaining uh, uh, growing uh, a business or growing yourself yeah. uh, personally. Well, um, I, I got to get a squeeze a minute in here. Uh, India, you think that blockchain could be key to uh, really getting India to that, that level of um, uh, participation in a global economy that, that it yeah. wants? Sure. Just to give you an example you know, for this problem, uh, for this question. So in COVID scenario, when the COVID vaccine will come, we need to distribute 7 million vaccines to all the people onto the earth. And as per the WHO report, one out of the four vaccine gets lost into the supply chain. So one of the startups, Startwick from India, have created a vaccine ledger on the blockchain where they can trace the vaccines from starting to the end. And this has been created under the guidelines of UNICEF. So they are closely working with the UNICEF to solve the problem of the vaccinations lost in, in the supply chain. So that can, these kind of answer, these kind of problem solving solution will help us improving our life and the global economy. Got it. 
Got it. Thank you so much to our panelists and uh, audience. Uh, the poll results are in. Uh, it's a tie between connectivity and lack of relevant skills as the biggest challenge to blockchain adoption that uh, is faced in developing nations. So thank you all. Uh, and thank you, especially panelists, for this great discussion. Uh, it was great to learn about the transformational nature of blockchain in emerging and developing markets. And I, I thank you on behalf of OECD for joining us. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Andy. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks, Caroline, as well. Bye, and ladies and gentlemen uh, of uh, our OECD Global Policy Summit, uh, I hope this was helpful to you over the past couple of hours as you shape policy where you are. It was my very great pleasure to be here. I'm Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast News, and we remain in service to these conversations and how you're shaping the future as we speak. With that, I'll hand it off to Carolyn Malcolm, Head of OECD Global Blockchain Policy Center. Uh, Carolyn, over to you. It was great to be here. Thanks so much, Angie. You did a wonderful job. We really appreciate everyone who could join us this morning, both of our speakers, but also all of you who are with us in the audience. We appreciate your contributions and, and sharing in this conversation with us. I'm really excited, though, because we're about to head into the deep dives this afternoon, and we have some great topics that are coming up, things that are really important on the policy frontier, both at a very hands-on level, and there I'm talking about things like our colleagues from the Financial Action Task Force who will be talking about their latest work on, on virtual assets and digital identity. You can also get your hands dirty with a workshop that we're doing on DLT for central banks, and you'll even have the chance to win an LB coin. So I encourage you to join the team from the Lithuanian Central Bank for them to talk to you a little bit about their project. Um, we'll also be having a session with Simon Zadik, uh, who's been leading a report from the UN Secretary General on people's money, the future of financing the SDGs and the role of digitalization in that process. He'll be talking with Jemima Kelly from the Financial Times. And then later on this afternoon, or perhaps this morning, depending on where you are, some of the virtual booths that we have there from our sponsors and see what they might have on, on offer that might be of interest for you. So thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back in 15 minutes. Thanks a lot.